Okay. So I realize that this is a massive download of information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But you've made it very personal too. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, I really, I, I do want to get this all out there. And it, it is recorded and be on the website. You have the handouts. So. Even if it's coming out too fast for you to assimilate it all, <laughs> and then we have, we have, we have lots of opportunity yet in the future to, to clarify it. I just don't know how much opportunity. I, I feel a little bit of urgency when I get all this stuff out, so that you have it, and it becomes more difficult for me to, to become a teacher. So, um, so please take advantage of that. And also, while you're taking advantage of, uh, advantage of that, uh, see how maybe you can uh, help, you know, help make this teaching accessible to other people as well. Uh, and help. We always use help with cataloging the, uh, uh, the recordings on the website to make it easier for people to find specific topics and uh, stuff like that. Make it, it'll make it easier for you, make it easier for other people. And I can say, I'm sorry, I, if I was 30 years younger, I feel like I had a lot more, I maybe wouldn't be so inclined to download so much information at once. Although I probably would. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of just the way I am, my karma. <laughs> okay. So, we'll finish up by talking about the 12 links of dependent arising. Now, these, uh, the, w what these are is a description of a process that's going on in your mind all of the time. And, uh, but we have 12 links here. But actually this is a little bit of a synthesis. When, when the Buddha spoke of links of dependent arising. Sometimes he spoke of five, sometimes eight, different numbers. But if we go through the sutras, the different times that he used, that he was discussing these links of dependent arising, put them all together, we come up with a total of 12. And there's been various attempts in the history of Buddhism to try to explain why there are 12 and, and the way they are. But, uh, and, and I'll go over that a little bit with you, but let's just begin, let's have a look at what these 12 links are and what they say. Now they're set out according to the, the basic formula of dependent arising. When there is this, there is that, okay? So when there is ignorance, there are mental formations. Right. Now at this point, I will, even when there's not ignorance, there's still mental formations. Mm -hmm. okay. But this, these 12 links is about describing how we keep ourselves immersed in this cycle of suffering and, and making bad karma for ourselves. And so Ignorance is important. So when there is ignorance, there are mental formations. Where there are mental formations, there is consciousness. Okay, a, a mind that's producing mental formations is a conscious mind. Uh, when there is consciousness, uh, there is the mind and body of an individual person, Nama and Rupa. When there is the mind and body of an individual person, there is consciousness. Whoops, I've gone backwards, haven't I? What? Mm -hmm. yeah. But, I don't know, it's not really whoops, it's not whoops. That's the same thing the Buddha did. He said, when there, when there is consciousness, there is Nama and Rupa. When there is Nama and Rupa, there is consciousness. These totally fold back on each other. Mm -hmm. And a relationship of mutual causality. If you go back to the part of the handout where we talked about uh, the five aggregates, 
consciousness, you'll, you'll see exactly what he's saying. I am conscious. I am conscious of something. What am I conscious of? I'm conscious of these six kinds of things. These six kinds of things fall in two categories. Uh, mind and matter. And in terms of an individual self, the material part is my body, ultimately reducible to sensations. So, so mind and sense. There is mental objects and sensations, mind and body. When there is consciousness, there is consciousness of mental objects and sensations, mind and body. When there is mind and body, there is consciousness. That, that's what this is. Okay, so it falls back on itself. Where there is a mind and body of an individual person, there are the six sense bases. The sixth being what we call the mind sense, by which you know the mental objects. Okay with that one? Okay. Where, where there's a, a mind and body with six senses, inevitably there's going to be a contact between a sense object and one of the senses. A visual object and, and vision, a mental object and uh, the mind sense. There will be contact. So when there are senses, there's contact. When there's contact, there's feeling. Once again, this is something we noticed with the five aggregates, that everything that arises as an object of consciousness, whether it's a sense object or whether it's a mental object, is associated with a feeling, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. So where there is contact, there is feeling. Where there is feeling, there is craving. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, when these arrive, in reaction to that, there arises, there arises craving. Craving for more of what feels good, craving for less of what feels bad, or sometimes just a craving for something else if it's neutral. Neutral is kind of boring, we want something more interesting. So, where there is feeling, there is craving. Where there is craving, there is clinging. Clinging is This kind of goes back to the intentions that we're talking about. Where there's clean, there is this reification. There is there's me, and there's this thing that feels good, and I want more of it, and so this is what I'm going to do to get more of this thing that feels good. That's what that's what the word clinging means. Um, I use clinging here because it's such a common way of translating the word dupadana. Um Grasping maybe is a little bit more accurate. It's grasping to the self is real, grasping to the object is real, and grasping to the idea that this is what's making me feel good as real. That's what it's grasping to. Uh, a more literal translation of Upadana is fuel. <laughs> okay. But you can see that it's, it's within this, uh, this link of clinging that as a result of craving, there arises this, you know, I want to do this to obtain that result. And I'm real, and it's real, and if I succeed in this, I'll get the result I want. So, where there is craving, there is clinging. Where there is clinging, there is becoming. That's where you actually, where you move from intention to action. Now, it can mean where you move into physical action, it can mean where you move into verbal action, but it also can mean where your mind moves and generates a perception, a thought, an emotion, something like that. That is becoming. And with becoming, at this, at this link of becoming, you become a, a person trying to grasp this thing that you, try, trying to obtain this thing that you desire, trying to avoid this thing that, that you have aversion towards. Where there is becoming, there is birth, coming into being, or coming forth as an individual <coughs> person. Then, as an individual person in this moment, you are 
you're experiencing suffering, struggle, surviving, you know, the, the need to survive, the need to do, you're either getting what you want or not getting what you want. It's the whole aging, death, and the entire mass of suffering. The way that's described. So, where there is birth, there is aging, death, and this entire mass of suffering. This is the way it's laid out, yeah? So consciousness, though, uh, couldn't you still have consciousness of the six senses and be awakened? And Yes, and, you can. And this uh, is describing, in this order, this is describing the ordinary state of the, of the world, like ordinary person. This is describing, you see, craving, clinging, those are not present in, in the fully awakened being. Craving is present in only in a very limited sense for the uh, non-returner. Craving is present only in a very attenuated sense for a once-returner. Um, clinging is modified in, in the stream entrance. So, and, and ignorance isn't present uh, right. in a waking being. So, so this, is, this is entirely a description of the ordinary person. What's going on in the ordinary person's mind? Okay? Now, as a whole sequence, it's a bit awkward. And the Buddha didn't teach it as a whole sequence. He, he taught it in pieces at different times to make a particular point, to illustrate a particular thing. There's kind of a chord to this which is, particularly the, the, the real heart of it is contact leads to feeling, leads to craving, leads to clinging, leads to becoming. And then we go back and then there's resumption of contact, feeling, craving, clinging, becoming, and then contact once again. That's sort of the core. You can expand this out to include uh, different, different components of it, but the whole thing as t in 12, gets rather clumsy. And if you, uh, if we look at it, there's a way of looking at it uh, to divide it. There's the first two, there's the middle eight, and then there's the last two. Okay? And if you divide it up in that way, it kind of makes more sense. The first is an introduction to uh, the cycle. Now, You'll recall mental formations from when we talked about the five aggregates. Mental formations include uh, craving, it includes intentions, it includes perceptions, okay, which is essentially saying it includes craving and it includes clinging. Because it, uh, there's craving, and as a result of craving, it's clinging, and clinging is where. The in, intentions arise, and this is where you reify your view of the world. I am me, that is that, I want that, or I don't want that, and so forth. So, with that in mind, that mental formations includes craving and clinging. We look at these first two, so where there is ignorance, there is craving and clinging. And we just looked at the process here of making new karma. Where there's craving and intentions and acting on intentions, you're reinforcing ignorance. Your intentions, your craving and your intentions are being, your craving and your um, ignorance are being reinforced by your intentions. Right? So really this two, first two can be seen as kind of a summary. Ignorance leads to craving and clinging, that leads to more ignorance, which leads to more clay craving and clinging, which, you know, so it's a summary of the cycle. And then we can move on and get treat the middle A as kind of a unit, where there's consciousness, there's mind and body, where there's mind and body, there's six senses, where there's six senses there is inevitably contact. With contact comes feeling. With feeling comes craving. With craving comes clinging. With clinging comes becoming. Now, at this point, it goes back again. But where it really goes back to is contact. Okay, so let's go through that. You're, you're, you're conscious, you have a mind and body, you have senses, and you, 
you feel something and it feels good. Oh, that feels good. Oh, I like that. I want more of that. Craving. Okay? You're craving, then in your mind there is, is, is me, this body, and there's this thing that feels good, and I'm going to go get more of this feel good. Okay, that's clinging. Becoming, you set yourself in motion. You start to act. Now when you act, this, your act is going to produce a result which is going to be known by means of your sense, senses. Okay, I reach out for more of this feel good. Now you're either going to, well, you're going to have a sensory experience as a result of that reaching out, right? So that's going to bring you back to contact. Now you're reaching out, might have been successful. You now, you know, you now feel the presence of the thing that you wanted. And, or, or it might have, might have you, you might have reached out and failed to get it. Okay? Let, let's, let's, let's go through it this time, failed to get it. <coughs> you reached out and you failed to get it. So now, there's contact with the senses. It is the sensory experience of not having what you wanted. There's the feeling of unpleasantness, because I didn't get what I wanted. And so, now once again, there's craving and clinging and becoming. Um, in, a, in, in a scenario, we can make up a scenario where you see something in the store, you try to get it, you don't have enough money, you're disappointed. So, now we get back to craving and clinging, you think, okay, I've got to find some other way of getting this. I'll wait until the storekeeper's not looking, and then and I'll grab it. And so that's becoming, and you do that, and you grab it, and then you're back to contact. You feel the, you you, you feel the security guard's handcuffs around your hands, yeah. <laughs> and on it goes, right? I mean, you could make up any scenario you want because this process is going on all the time, all day long. Mm -hmm. You see somebody, you hear what they say, uh, it gives you a feeling, it results in a desire. So you say something to elicit a particular response. You get the response, or you don't. Whatever, you 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 assess what's happened once you know it through your senses, and you have a whole interaction with this other being. And this whole interaction is just you recycling through contact to becoming, contact to becoming, contact to becoming. Eventually, the episode comes to an end. You walk out of the room, you go somewhere else, you see, you feel, you hear something else, and it starts all over again. Do you see? How this is describing the process that's going on in your mind all the time. And that's the that that's the value of it. It's describing what's always going on in your mind. When when you were in the one situation, you you were one person. You were totally engrossed in that search of situation. When the situation ended, you walked out of the room and you found yourself in a new situation. You're reborn in a sense. Okay. So now we look at this other part of it, you know, this the, the, the birth, aging, death, and this entire mass of suffering. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a summary. This, the repetitions of this cycle creates an episode in your life. You know, the beginning of the cycle, you're born, you, you go through it over and over and over again, and eventually the whole episode is over with, and you move on to a new one. So you're kind of reborn with every one of these episodes in your life. You're kind of reborn in every moment. You know, as as you go from seeing what you want and then trying to get what you want and then reacting to either getting or not getting it, each of these things is like a little mini rebirth and they all add up together to this larger rebirth which is an episode in the life of so and so. And over the course of the day, there may be 15, 20, 1,000, who knows how many episodes that make up a day in the life of so-and-so. Then so-and-so goes to bed and goes to sleep. They wake up in the morning and they're reborn as a new person. Of course, they've inherited the body, the debts, the dirty laundry, everything of the person that passed away into sleep the night before. They are reborn every day. <laughs> So that's what this is describing. Links 5 through 10 describe a cycle that repeats itself over and over again throughout every day of our lives. 
the action produced by becoming results in the generation of new sense objects, physical or mental. You know, it could be, it could be that the that the craving led, led to the intention, which caused a particular emotion to arise. You got angry, you know, and then the next sensory experience is the experience of being angry. It could be a mental object. The anger is arising, but anyway, resulting in the in generation of new sense objects. Physical or mental, thoughts, emotions, sensations, whatever, resulting in contact, feeling, craving, clinging, and returning to becoming, uh, and, and return to becoming, which then leads back to contact again. To repeating cycles, individual conscious events get woven together to become episodes in the day of the life of the person born from this causal process. So th this is. This is another example where the Buddha has taken a popular notion, the endless cycle of reincarnation in this, say, in this case, and redefined it, shifting it from the material plane, getting born of a human mother in a physical body, living, aging, and dying, to, to the mental plane. The cycle of rebirth, driven by the links of dependent arising, describes the continuous process I was craving a delusion of a being, of being a separate self in a world of other results in suffering. Is that in our handout, all that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's all in your handout. And I'll just point out to you that if you start reading the sutras, will you understand that when the Buddha is discussing rebirth, there are, there are occasions where somebody comes to the Buddha and they're crying and said, oh, my child died, you know, my son died, he was such a wonderful person, where is he going to be reborn? And the Buddha says, oh, don't worry, he'll be reborn in a day or I mean, he's not talking about this there, he's just, I mean, what else are you going to say to the person? <laughs> your, your son, who was such a good person and took such good care of you, died, and so now I'm going to tell you that, you know, your God is not going to be reborn. No, the Buddha didn't do that. But all the other places where the Buddha mentions rebirth, if you interpret rebirth in terms of this cycle of dependent arising, rather than as reincarnation, what you're going to find is that everything starts to make a lot more sense to you. The purpose of these 12 lines. What he's trying to do is to show how this happens, and also to identify the link that can be broken, and, and how we can go about breaking that. Of these links, there's only one that can be broken, and that is craving. That's an important thing to understand. Let's just go back and look at these. Okay. When there is consciousness, there's mind and body. You can't separate those. When there's mind and body, they're going to be the sixth sense basis. I mean, you could pluck out the eyes. You could destroy the ears. You could cut out the tongue. You could cut off the nose. But as long as there's consciousness, there's at least going to be the mind and mental objects. There's still going to be. There's going to be a sense base, of, of, at least one sense base. So there's going to be contact. Oops. Where there's going to be contact, there's feeling. This is inevitable. Even in a fully awakened being, even a Buddha, a Buddha experiences feeling. Every, every mental and every sensory event is accompanied by a feeling of pleasant, unpleasant, or neither for a Buddha. Becoming awakened isn't about not, things not feeling good or bad anymore. They still feel good or bad. It's about whether you suffer or not when they feel good or bad. So feeling, feeling is inevitable, Buddha is included. This is the link, link that can be broken, is craving. Now, when craving is present, you cannot stop clinging from occurring. That's not a link that can be broken. If there is craving, clinging will occur. If there is clinging, becoming will occur. So craving mm -hmm. is the one link that can be broken. But how do we go about breaking it? Okay. And there's two parts to this. One is we work backwards through this. 
the becoming, that's where we act on our intentions. You can, if you can restrain yourself from acting on unwholesome intentions, if you can not squish the spider, even better if you can act on wholesome intentions. But by not acting on unwholesome intentions, you, it has an effect on the strength of the clinging that occurs. So this is something that you can do. And remember, the clinging corresponds to intention. Right? So by not acting on your bad intentions, the, the bad intentions become weakened, and eventually you can eliminate bad intentions, and you can only act on good intentions. And what do good intentions arise out of? Okay. Wisdom. Or well, I mean, the standard for you said bad intentions arise out of desire and aversion and ignorance. Let's say desire and aversion. Good intentions arise out of, or I'll put it, here's the way I said it earlier, you'll get it right. Bad intentions arise out of greed and hatred. Ignorance. Well, the good intentions are right of not greed, not hatred, and, and wisdom. Right? Okay. So if you work, if you work on becoming and clinging, basically what you're doing is is you're 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 retroactively weakening craving, right? Retroactively, that doesn't sound like the right. You're anyway. But next next time through the cycle. When you get to craving, it's not going to be as strong. You keep doing this every time you get back to craving. Here you've been, you've been cultivating good intentions and not acting out of bad ones, and the good intentions have been not craving, you know, not greed, not hatred, not craving. So you're making, you're making craving weaker and weaker every time you do that. So you understand this. So now through the practice of, of good, of right intentions or the practice of virtue, you are weakening craving. Then the other way that we attack craving is through meditation, through uh, right effort, right concentration, and right mindfulness. And now we have insight experiences and we have, we have both insight and equanimity that we develop. When insight and equanimity are strong enough and when craving is weak enough, which is kind of saying the same thing. To weaken craving is to strengthen equanimity. And to zero craving is maximum equanimity. Okay. So by these two roots, by, by by working on becoming and clinging, we you know that that's the practice of right intention and that's virtue and we're weakening craving. And then through the practice of right effort, right kind of concentration, right mindfulness, we're creating equanimity. And, and insight so that eventually the moment is going to come where there is contact with one of the sense organs and it is going to result in a feeling of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, but clinging, but craving is not going to occur. It's all your life your mind got to this point, there's been craving, and then clinging, the reification has occurred. Uh, a metaphor you can use is it's a monkey swinging through the trees in the jungle, he never lets go of the last branch until he grabs the next one, right? Until this time. He lets go of this one, and let's, just falls. There is no craving. That is the point at which nirvana arises. There's a cessation of craving, cessation of mental formations. They're in a fully conscious state because you've been practicing meditation. You experience this. You experience reality no longer obscured by the mind's fabrications. You've broken the link and if your mind is properly prepared, the result of this is the kind of insight that changes you from being a worldling to being uh, an uh, awakened being.
first stage, but still, you're now, when you're no longer a world, when you're away from there. And this is actually the way it's going to happen every time. You will learn to experience nirvana regularly. You will learn to bring your equanimity and your insight to the pitch that's necessary so that you'll repeat this experience. In, you'll be going through this cycle, you'll hit the craving link, and that link will be broken, and you'll experience nirvana as fruition. The first time you hit it, that was, that was path attainment. That's where you became stream entry. Thereafter, each time is a re-experiencing of fruition, and that, that is going to reinforce as going to reinforce your understanding until you become right that, that to achieve the second path, to become a, a, a once return. And it's going to happen exactly the same way. You're going to be cycling through, cycling through, cycling through, and your, your insight and, and your equanimity are going to be strong enough. The link of craving is going to be broken, but this time, instead of being a repetition of the fruition experience, it's going to be second path attainment and you're going to become uh, a, a once-returner. And the same thing, you'll become a non-returner, you'll become, uh, you'll become an arhat. So, that's the purpose of the Twelve Links, is to understand this process that's going on inside you. And it's and the Buddha taught this so he could point out exactly how do I make this happen. And this is how you make it happen. Okay? Yeah. And it says with the cessation of becoming comes cessation of rebirth. So then at that point you are you recognize the self in everything and therefore no need for the rebirth. That's right. Although this does happen by stages, and so it's not the first. The first round isn't going to be the permanent cessation of rebirth, but it is the cessation of rebirth. What exactly is rebirth? Did I miss that? I don't know if I missed that. Rebirth is just coming into being again as a deluded, as a deluded person who's subject to craving. Okay, so even a stream enterer still has craving. And even a stream enterer still has some delusion. Likewise, even the once returner still has craving. The craving uh, that a uh, once returner experiences is much, much weaker than the craving that uh, a stream enterer experiences, which in turn is much more manageable than the craving that an ordinary person experiences. But it still has craving. Okay? And uh, there still is. There still is, right up until uh, being an arahat, there's still, you're still subject to uh, a certain degree of delusion because you still, have, you still have the sense of being separate. Even though you know you're not, and even though you've had these profound experiences that have made that knowledge an unshakable certainty, you have no question in your mind that you are not a separate self, but you still feel separate. And so that's that's the remaining delusion, even of even of a once returner, even of a non returner. A non returner has no craving at all for things of this world, of the sensory world, the desire world. Because as a once returner, the non returner uprooted all of that and destroyed all of that craving. That was really his work that he did in that state. And then became a non returner. But he still has a craving for being craving for becoming. And um, still has that last vestige of feeling like a separate self. But with the final round of this process, becoming an arha, then the sense of a separate self is completely gone and there is no craving remaining at all. So if we can become aware 
of the circumstances in our lives where we suffer. Mm -hmm. Those are the clues as to where craving is present. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And if we can be willing to forego the, the um, strengthening of self that comes from that suffering, from anger and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from negative emotions, we can be willing to forego that, yeah. that strengthening, then we can begin to break this. Is there, are those specific? I'm, I'm looking for specific mm -hmm. examples. Yeah, that, that, those are. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly the kind of specific example. You have a thousand opportunities every day yeah. to do this, and choose the big, glaring, obvious ones to work on first. Okay, so I won't indulge in anger, or I yeah. choose. I will choose. To, to let go of this. You, you make anger a target of your mindfulness. Okay. And you're, you're just not, you're not, you just make the determination that I'm not going to let anger come along and sweep me away and then just feel, feel bad about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. okay. And you work on that until you get good at it. And the anger will start to be, it, it will start to be less frequent. And then you can expand your horizons and zero in and two or three other things. Mm -hmm. Also, in the process of doing this, you're going to become much more sensitive. So there's going to be all of those things, all those events during the day where uh, previously you might not have been able to even clearly discern the operation of, of craving. But now it starts to become more obvious. Okay. But let's not forget the good side of it, the, the frosting on the cake, too. We're just talking about work here. But the thing is, is you're going to find yourself a lot happier, a lot more at ease, a lot less stressed out by things mm -hmm. as a result of this. But all of which is going to make it just that much easier and it's going to motivate you that much more to continue. It is, as I described it yesterday, um, what's the proper term for it? Uh, is this an asymptotic curve? Uh, an exponential curve? That's an exponential Maybe curve. Maybe exponential. Just one that, one that's, uh, the, it, I know this part of it's exponential. I'm mm -hmm. talking about one that starts off gradually, gradually, yeah, gradually, and then it becomes exponential. Stuff exponential. Like that, yeah. Yeah. It, it's also, it's asymptotic if it never reaches. Oh, that's right. Asymptotic. <laughs> reaches, right? Okay, no. It's not asymptotic. Anyway, the point about there's two parts, there's two parts like to this curve. That. You know, it creeps along the x-axis and it doesn't seem to rise very rapidly at first. You've got to be patient, you know, they keep saying, oh, is this really weird? We're getting anywhere. And it reaches kind of a break point, and now it's climbing up the y-axis, just going faster and faster and faster and faster, right? So that's, that's the, the curve's got these two parts to it. Well, but it's all called exponential, including the first part. Oh, I guess it. I, I it's used, true. It's true. I, I used to be much more mathematically wise than I am now. I used to know all this stuff. I wouldn't have made the mistake of using the word asymptotic at one time. Around. But that's not right. <laughs> I don't need that anymore. I can always ask somebody else. <laughs> uh, yeah, but the point I want to make is. There are the two parts. There's the part where it raises really gradually and it tests your patience. And then there's the Yahoo uh, it starts rising really rapidly. Is it is it as smooth as you do, uh, you you have described in in other work that I have done, say practicing a musical instrument, you have a very jagged feeling that is only gradually increased. I and so I, you fall back a lot. See my background is in the biological sciences. And that's where you take a graph with data points that looks like somebody fired a shotgun at it, and you draw a smooth curve through <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so shotgun points, and you're just yeah. pointing the way. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually really important, isn't it? Because your individual experience at a moment looks like it's a regression or whatever compared yeah. to the previous one, and then you think, oh, I conclude it's not working. Yes, you have to accumulate enough, and you go, oh, it is working. 
But from any between any two points, it doesn't look like it is. So. That's right. If you take enough points into it, it's right. So it's always really important to compare where you are now to where you were six months ago. Because if you compare it to yesterday, it's going to look bad. <laughs> Or if it looks really good, that means tomorrow you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what happened to the death in the last one? Was to the which? The death. Uh, well, this is <laughs> With the cessation of rebirth, <laughs> the entire mass of suffering comes to an end. But that, that, that includes the death and the entire mass of suffering because people, I don't know, I've heard some teachers say that you can, well, you transcend death and you don't have to. Well, uh, there's a sense in that there is really a sense in which you transcend death because. The dissolution of the five aggregates is not the same thing as the death of the self. You transcend death by realizing that there is no self to die. It doesn't, I mean, I, I don't think I need to say this probably, but it doesn't mean that you'll still be walking around 5,000 years from now, you know, like the vampire of a stat. <laughs> that's that's not the way it means. It's transcending death. You you really transcend death in that you you realize that there really isn't isn't such a thing. That there's only the dissolution of the five aggregates. So yes. And I just wanted to. This whole description is meant to describe the, the mental process. Yeah. So the idea of rebirth as this uh, new, be new experience within the mental constructs and all of that, as opposed to physical body. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because the, this this was, you see, this was a. This was the paradigm that was in place before the Buddha came along, is that samsara is the cycle of death and reincarnation and suffering and karma and all of that. And there was a, a, a language, a terminology that everybody spoke. And so what he did is he reframed it. And the Buddha's approach was, if it makes you feel better to believe in reincarnation, go ahead, but try to understand this. Okay? And if you, can, if you truly understand this, he knew that you weren't going to need to cling to the idea of reincarnation anyway. You were going to let go of it. So, so I think that's why he felt really comfortable using this. Because everybody was already taking the incarnation for granted, so he used this to give them a different way of thinking about it, without necessarily contradicting what they already believe. Now, I'll tell you what later Buddhists did. Later Buddhists divided this up the same way: two, eight, and two, and they said. Ignorance, where there's ignorance, there are mental formations. That's describing, instead of saying that well, that's a summary of the core process, they said, now that's your previous incarnation. In your previous incarnation, you were ignorant and you amassed all these karmic mental formations. And the middle A describes this lifetime. You're born into this world as a conscious being with a mind and body and six senses and so on and so forth. And then they said that the last two are describing your next lifetime. That you live this life as a worldling, and then eventually you are going to uh, be born, age, and death again. So you're going to have an, uh, another reincarnation after this that is caused by 
the previous one. Unless you break the chain, right? Unless you break the chain, right. So they made it physical, but in reality, the dissolution of the five aggregates pretty much ends your being as a as the person you think you are. That's right. So the idea that there's another chance for enlightenment or awakening is only because the truth of reality, of ultimate reality, is that the self is already in everything and in every being, um, but not obviously in any stream of consciousness or, uh, right. or leftover yeah. karma. Yeah. And many Buddhist religions have struggled in different ways to try to resurrect the self. And this term, stream of consciousness, uh, has come up a number of times. And this is one of the ways to try to, to, that they've tried to resurrect it, is that somehow there is this continuous stream of consciousness that ends up being the, the carrier of uh, the karma into a next life. <laughs> and it's amazing to me that that idea, I mean, I can really understand the appeal of that. People really want to resurrect the self. I understand the appeal of it. But I'm amazed that these religions have been able to sustain it. Because there is a sutra that, where specifically one of the Buddha's disciples, and I think he was a stream entrant, <coughs> was trying to figure it out what was being reincarnated, and he said, oh, it's, it's consciousness, consciousness. And the Buddha just tears a strip out of him and says, you know, you foolish man, where did you ever get that idea? You never heard me say any such thing. So the Buddha himself debunked the stream of consciousness mm -hmm. idea. Which sutra? What's that? Which sutra do you remember? Uh, it's, it's the sutra of Sati the Fisherman's son. Sati the Fisherman's son. But I do know that the particular tradition that usually quotes this stream of consciousness idea, it's also a tradition which strongly discourages any of its members to ever read the sutras. Hmm. They have them read only the commentaries. Huh. So I guess that's how they get away with it. Mm -hmm. So there, this kind of relates to something you were saying earlier about maybe they're wondering about the mechanism by which wisdom gets passed on. Mm -hmm. You know, and the mechanism is not clear, and so they invoked consciousness as being the mechanism. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. Well, and in a sense, you see, the thing is that if you understand consciousness as being not multiple but single, and being a universal principle right. that is everywhere, then it works. You don't make, not as an individual stream of consciousness, but in the continuity of consciousness as, as a single property that is, is universal, then, then you could describe that as the, as the carrier of, of wisdom and it would work a lot better. Yeah. You know, I, I've seen that uh, they say Buddha stops producing karma. Yes. I feel like that's one of these true teachings of Buddha or is that, is that part of the religion that's gotten... No, uh, uh, that is true. If you... The, if you look at the way the Buddha redefined karma right. as a movement towards nirvana and away from samsara and weakening the hold of, of, of craving and delusion on you, when, when ignorance is totally dispelled and you, and you have complete wisdom, when you are dwelling in nirvana, then, yeah, the, the karma becomes irrelevant. You don't have it. Hmm. Yeah, you don't have it. So, no, I, that, that's... That's a teaching. And you dwell in that state all the time if you're Buddha, right? Is that correct? That's right. Well, the the Buddha has this sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, the the Buddha. Well, at least during the lifetime of the Buddha, the mind, uh, uh, the 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 body and speech of the Buddha dwell in the world, in the marketplace, while the mind of the Buddha dwells in Nirvana. So there's this. There's this simultaneously, the, the Buddha is in the world. The Buddha sees things the same way that we see them, but the Buddha is completely immune to the illusion of it and knows it for what it really is. And so his mind of the Buddha is dwelling in nirvana. 
Yeah. But there is still intention and is still the cause and effect of it. intention. It's just not karma because it's not going towards nirvana because we're already there. Well, there, it's interesting that, that a Buddha, a Buddha's acts do involve intention and his intention arises out of compassion. Right. Compassion and loving kindness, all the things associated with it. <coughs> it his, his intentions are motivated by compassion and they're rooted in perfect wisdom. So he still has intentions. Right. Now, in, in the Abhidhamma, where they catalog all these things, right. they, they call, they, they, that falls into a different category. The intentions of a Buddha are not karmic anymore. They're in, they're in a karmic form. <laughs> in other words, they only produce results in the world. They don't produce any results that reflect back on the Buddha himself, because he doesn't need it. <laughs> there are no mental formations. Yeah, there's no mental formations, there's no mental consequences. However, a stream enterer, between stream enterer and Buddha, you're still not doing karma, but you still, are you, you're still no, not doing karma. Between stream and Buddha, you're still doing karma. <laughs> but you're already in nirvana. No, between, no, you're only periodically in nirvana. Periodically in nirvana, okay. Yeah. Okay. And in, in between periods in nirvana, you're making lots of karma, and... The same thing is true. You can slow your progress a lot by making the wrong kind of karma, or you can accelerate it greatly by making the right one. And while you're in the nirvanic state, where, whenever that while is, while you're, you're in the nirvanic state, you're, you're not karma. making any new karma. Okay. Right. Another thing that they say about Buddhists, this is not something the Buddha said about Buddhists, but subsequent Buddhist theologians said about Buddha. I, I, I know. How, without a god, how can you be a theologian? But you know, it's the same thing. Hmm. Buddhologians. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there is a word. It's Buddhology. <coughs> Buddhologists. That, that's a legitimate word. Buddhologists say that, <laughs> that actually a Buddha, just everything the Buddha does is totally spontaneous. His mind has become so perfected that he knows exactly what to say and do that is for the maximum benefit of those around him. And therefore, it requires no thought, no reflection, uh, you know, not even any intention. It's just, it's, it's fully automatic. It's fully automatic. An interesting notion, but there are some flaws with it. Nah, you don't want to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it says the Buddha is perfect and he could never he could never say or do anything that's not perfect. Because see what Buddhologists do is they say the Buddha represents the highest possible achievement. In, in, in the, and so therefore everything you say of Buddha about a Buddha has got to be the the mostest. The mostest and the bestest, right? So any statement you make about the Buddha. So therefore, everything he does is perfect, and no, nothing the Buddha says and no action he performs can ever be a mistake. On the other hand, there is a sutra where the Buddha gives this teaching on a particular meditation on the loathsomeness of the body, just before he goes into deep retreat for several months. And this was the last teaching here. This was a new method that he devised and presented. And so then he goes into retreat. He comes out, and in the meantime, some huge number, I think like 40 monks, have basically killed themselves or arranged to have somebody else kill them. <laughs> because they misinterpreted this, this meditation on the lonesomeness of the body. And to me, reading the Sutra, it's pretty clear, Buddha came out and says, whoops, messed up, <laughs> not a good idea. But the, the commentaries on that sutra, uh, influenced by the Buddhologists, they say, no, 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 that's not true at all. You see, the Buddha knew that they already had the karma to commit suicide. And that by doing it as a result of this teaching, you know, that they created the least bad karma for themselves. And so he gave this teaching for their benefit, <laughs> since he knew they were going to commit suicide anyway. 
What difference does it make if you create bad karma if you're dissolving the five in aggregates anyway? That that karma, that person is no longer. Well, what, what that means is the commentarialist who provided the solution, they didn't understand. They, they, they didn't, didn't come for this weekend. If they came for this weekend, they would yeah. have to think of another explanation. But if they came for this weekend, they probably wouldn't have felt the need for the Buddha to be absolutely perfect and capable of making a mistake either. So. <coughs> I have, um, can you give this explanation on, um, for me it's a little bit um, inconsistent. Okay, assume we begin on becoming, where is the break point? And then we get rid of craving and we start, um, supposedly we start um, having uh, no suffering anymore. Yes. Okay. Uh, but because uh, by Buddha's nature we uh, contemplate and we build in us compassion and love and patience and all those things. So aren't Buddha person more ca compassionable than let's say somebody who don't work on those things. So if I have more compassion I will be suffer also because I will see so much suffering around me and death and uh, uh, all kind of things going on. No, compassion does not imply suffering. Compassion implies the, the, the motivation to relieve the suffering of others. It doesn't mean you have to... You see... While you're still a worldling, that's the form that your compassion takes. You see yourself in the other suffering person, and you suffer because of them, and so you try to help them to relieve your own suffering. Mm -hmm. But a Buddha is beyond that. The, the, Buddha, the Buddha looks at you suffering, he knows that you're creating your own suffering, he really wants to help you, but he's not going to suffer because you're making yourself suffer. Uh, what if it's your um, loved one? children or whatever. Well, you, you think about it a little bit. Someone you love is suffering. Does your suffering help them? Well, let's turn it around. Have you ever been suffering and somebody you really cared about is is really miserable because you're suffering? How does that make you feel? I mean, I had that experience. People really care about me and it's like, God, can't you just let me be sick in peace? Do I have to <laughs> take care of you and your feelings too? <laughs> <laughs> it's really when somebody with, when you're when you have a difficulty and somebody else starts suffering because of your difficulty somebody that you care about suffers because of your difficulty it just gives you another burden to deal with it doesn't help at all and not only that if you're the one suffering out of compassion the most important thing about a compassion is that you're going to do whatever you can to help the other person and the suffering that your experience is going to get in the way of you seeing the clearest way and being able to do that most effectively. So there is absolutely no need for you to suffer in order to be totally compassionate. I don't know, but it affects you, you can sleep, because you think about the person yeah. who... You see, that's, that's the affliction that we have. That is the affliction that we have, is that... We're incapable of compassion without it making us suffer. Wouldn't you like to be able to have perfect compassion without the need for you to suffer? Because your suffering is only going to make their suffering worse, and your suffering is only going to hamper your ability to ease their suffering. To me, it's like careless. You don't care. It's not that you don't care. No. It's, it's not that you don't care. But, of course, if I, I know what you mean. You experience compassion through suffering on behalf of the other person. And because you do, you try to think, well, the only time that I wouldn't feel that would be when I didn't care. And so, yeah, based on your experience. But I'm saying, can't you see that it's not necessary? Can't you see that you could remove the suffering from your experience and still have just as much love and just as much compassion? This is uh, a good idea. And 
think about it, how mm -hmm. to yeah. put in your life. Think about it, part. and think about this as an example. Have you ever seen a mother, the child is, they're not really hurt, but they're, they're crying and they think they're hurt, right? Mm -hmm. And the mother's comforting the child, the mother loves the child, they're comforting them, making them feel better, but they're also laughing. Did <laughs> 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 you ever see that? I mean, that's, that's compassion without suffering. I mean, if the child had a broken leg, the mother would be suffering in her compassion. But because the mother knows the child is all right, she can comfort the child without needing to suffer. And that's, that's where the Buddha comes from. Yeah. An example my mom taught me once long ago was a veterinarian cannot stop and cry with the owner because the puppy is hurt. The veterinarian simply treats the dog. That is the compassion. Yeah, well, yeah, that is the compassion. And that's what I say. Your, your suffering only gets in the way. For that matter, you see abuses happening in the world, and you're motivated to do something to help, to the degree that you're hurt and angry because of what you see, that you increase the chances you're going to do the wrong thing, and you're going to make things worse instead of better. So, no, you, you, you have much more capacity for true compassion without suffering than you do with suffering. I wonder if if Christianity isn't off base in, in in this regard because it gives us this example mm -hmm. of this man who was a realized being supposedly mm -hmm. who because of compassion for humankind offered himself up to be crucified. Mm -hmm. I'm going and I'm and I just I just realized that that's, that's so backwards when you think about real compassion, it seems to me. Well, Christian theology is, that is a difficult and extremely complex subject. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't, I don't want you to, to... And one of the things that I appreciate more than ever is when you say Christians believe or Christianity says or something like that, speaking as though there's one thing, there's not really. Mm. I'm reading a little bit about the history of Christianity right now. And in the first several hundred years, there were so many forms of Christianity that were so different from each other, and so totally different than anything you find today. And then, there was a council of Nicaea, and they declared everybody that didn't agree with this one set of principles to be heretics. Mm -hmm. But then subsequently, Christianity is once again divided up into all these different streams who hold views that are in direct contradiction to each other. So we can't even speak as of, uh, of Christianity as though it's one thing, it's mm -hmm. anything. Like Buddhism is anything. But, yes, there are versions of Christianity that you look at this and you'd have to say, wow, they're emphasizing all the wrong things. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, there's also other versions that seem to embody a much more profound truth mm -hmm. as well. Okay. <coughs> Um, I wonder, I'm a little bit uh, confused or um, with the example of, the, of, of the, the teaching that the Buddha gave right before he went into retreat. Mm -hmm. And he came out and he's like, whoops. Because if uh, to be a Buddha, all boundaries have dissolved, so we have access to everyone's mind mm -hmm. and the state of their mind. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand actually how he would not have been able to know that they would react to this teaching. Well, in that way. Yeah, one of the things that later Buddhists would like to believe about the Buddha uh, is that he got up in the morning and he cast his mind out on everybody for a hundred miles around and immediately knew those people that were ripe for awakening, and everything he said was directed towards bringing them to awakening, you know, and so he always said the right things at the right time. Um, that would be lovely. I, 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 I love the idea of that's, that's true, but I also see that the Buddha might have been able to know the minds of others, but he might not have been able, on the one hand, to know the minds of uh, that particular group of people well enough to predict in advance how they were going to misinterpret what he said. Or is it possible that there was a 41st that actually did get great benefit from that and maybe 
That's it. Uh, I mean, all, all kinds of things are because isn't a Buddha in all, all, all kinds of things are possible. Well, what I'm saying, as well as relative, is that which isn't a Buddha that's all thing is that they're in constant uh, communion in a sense with ultimate nature as well as relative or um, see, or this is correct. the thing about omniscience considering that every person lives in their own mind created reality. For the Buddha to be omniscient, he would have to be able to fully grasp everybody's different mind-created reality. That's a heavy thing to lay on, on any mind, even, even a fully awakened mind. The other thing, though, is that these 40 people, it's, it's not uh, these 40 monks, it's not that, that as soon as he finished talking uh, and went off into a retreat, that they all committed suicide right. together. More likely what's happened, and the story doesn't tell us this, but you know how these things happen, is Buddha was in retreat for months, and they talked to each other, and somebody said, well, this is what it means, and somebody else says, no, it wasn't, and they discussed it, and until they all convinced each other that, wow, this is really what he meant, that the body is such a loathsome thing that the best thing we can do is destroy our bodies as quickly and efficiently as possible. How could you expect the Buddha to look into their minds and know as clearly, know clearly enough that this was going to be the result, that he could predict that that they were going to have this discussion, they were going to all do this. I just don't. I just don't need to expect that as a Buddha. I mean, if we try to deify, well, it's just omniscience is a very big word. And it it is having big big that word. power. Yeah. That's to my understanding. Well, the thing is, the Buddha never said he was omniscient. It's only oh, okay. people later on. Okay. This is Buddhology. This is when okay. you say, a Buddha, a fully awakened Buddha, has got to be the mostest and the bestest of everything. So somebody says, okay, well, what is it? Then? Uh, knowledge. Knows everything. Omniscient. How did the Buddha define Buddhahood? Of being awakened? Of uh, being awakened, that's right. He doesn't define it in terms of, of omniscience. That came later. So Nirvana, so he didn't go farther than Nirvana versus, because I know like in, in the lineage that I've been trained in, uh, to the degree that I've been trained in, um, there's Nirvana and then there's ultimate um, enlightenment. I mean, and there's, and there's a separation between Nirvana and... And that's an invention that came long, much after the Buddha. That, what they did is they demoted the arhat to a lower status and they created this other status. It really has nothing to do with what the Buddha taught. And, uh, you know, that's where all, all this Buddhology comes from. It comes from later. It's come from people wanting the Buddha to be a god. Mm-hmm. So they made Buddha into a god. In the same way the Christian's God had to be omniscient, the Buddha had to be omniscient. And all of these other qualities. And if you want to believe that, I don't have a problem with you, but I tell you, I don't think it's necessary. And what what the earliest Buddhist tradition, Buddhist tradition does is it makes a distinction between Buddhas, who are arahats, and were fully awakened. And Samasam Buddhas. Samasam Buddhas. The difference between a Samasam Buddha and your run of the mill Buddha is that a Samasam Buddha knows how to teach effectively. That's the difference. And so Siddhartha Gautama was a Samasam Buddha. Many of the people who became Buddhas as a result of his training did not have that talent, they didn't have the ability to say just the right thing, to express it in a way, to get the idea across, and to quickly bring a whole lot of other people to the awakening. They weren't as good teachers. So there was this distinction made between a Samasam Buddha and a Buddha. Later on what they did is they made the Samasam Buddha into a kind of a godlike figure, a supernatural figure, a figure that stood outside of causes and conditions a figure that had miraculous powers and omniscience and all of these other things. And they took all of the other Buddhas and they stripped them of their Buddhahood and said, you're arhats, you, you just became enlightened for selfish reasons to escape your own suffering. Yeah. 
That's not Buddha. That's not the teaching of the Buddha. That is a Buddhist religion. It's a Buddhist religion that developed much later. And, and, and I don't need it. I don't need Buddha to be a supernatural being. I think you just made actually a good point, or something that made me think of a question, which is, are we trying to get enlightened to escape suffering? And isn't that what you just said, kind of? What we're trying to do is get enlightened to escape from our suffering. If we succeed, <coughs> if we succeed, we will have completely transcended our sense of self. This is pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. <coughs> this, this is starting where you are. You cannot become awakened and not... Right. Want to help? And, and, well, you can't become awakened and not cease to be yourself. You know, I, you will never become awakened because you will become awakened when you cease, when you drop the illusion of separate self -hood. But until that point, it is kind of a selfish... Not necessarily. Or... Well, it's, uh, until, until you've reached the first stage of awakening, it's purely selfish. Because your mind can't function any other way. Right. Once you've reached the first stage of awakening, and you've had that experience, you've dwelt in nirvana, and of course the more, the more often you experience the fruition and dwell in nirvana, then, then the more effective this, this is. But yeah. that is the point at which there is, you begin to become unselfish. Mm -hmm. But you're still selfish. Mm -hmm. But there's a, the, your selfishness diminishes. Mm -hmm. But it's impossible. The idea of a selfish arhat is completely... It, it's, it's a ludicrous notion. An arhat is defined as someone who has overcome the fetter of belief, uh, of the sense of being a separate self. They totally overcome that. It is not possible sure. to be a selfish arhat. No, no, no. I, just, I didn't mean that. I meant us. <laughs> uh -huh. But yes, yes, we're so selfish. That's right. We like start the, off the, the goal of enlightenment is to, or at least at first, is to end suffering. Yeah. To end our own suffering, and then, you know, maybe at our cut uh, level, you don't have a sense of self, so you, everything you do is for everyone. Well, and, and that's the thing, you know. Uh, we begin wanting to end our own suffering. But we can adopt the, we, we, we can adopt the bodhisattva position and say that I want to overcome I want to work to overcome everyone's suffering. Yeah. And and that's a really thing. But it only starts to become true after we we've, we've become sufficiently awakened. To yeah. I mean, I, I certainly would like to think that. I'm working on this path to end the suffering of all beings, yeah. but I don't have a grasp on how I can end the suffering of all beings. Well, I, only, I only have a grasp on yeah. how I can end That's right. the suffering of... That, and that, and that <laughs> is absolutely right, because the way it's going to... Until you become a stream entrant, you are trying to end your own suffering, and you're cultivating the attitude of wanting to get to be for the benefit. Once you become a stream entrant, then you're actually... From that point on, you are working for the benefit of all things. You're still working for your selfish benefit, but you're working for the benefit of all things. Mm -hmm. right. So you, no one becomes a stream entrant without becoming a bodhisattva. The, the taking a bodhisattva vow is only of utility for somebody who's a worldling. Once you become a stream entrant, it's a bit superfluous. Although doing it overtly, I mean, it has a human mind the way it is. When we say something straight out, you know, it it it, it empowers us. But everyone who becomes a stream mantra is actually a bodhisattva. What does it mean? A bodhisattva is somebody. No, no, stream mantra. Stream, stream mantra. Stream is it's the first stage of awakening. It's the person who has realized that that their their ego self. The, the, that they are not their ego self, that their personality view and attachment to it is just a mental construct. That's a stream enter. First stage of enlightenment. So anybody who's reached the first stage of enlightenment is automatically a bodhisattva. And anybody who's become an arhat 
cannot be selfish. It's impossible to be a selfish arhat. But some arhats can be some of Buddhas because they have the ability to teach and guide others. And some Buddhas, the ben- they still benefit all beings, but they benefit all things through their own awakening. And since, because their awakening is part of all of our awakening. Anytime anybody come, buddy becomes an arhat, everybody benefits. It's just that some don't have the additional talent to go out and teach on top of that. Yeah. Stream enters can still be befuddled by the world and still get sucked yeah. into to yeah. the stuff. That's yeah. happening, but they know the construct is sucking them in. Yeah, and they, they don't get sucked in for long. Yeah. Yeah. But they, you know, it's uh, the stream enter is something called the seven times returner, return seven times to samsara. That means that the stream enter can forget herself. The, the stream enter can forget herself and get lost in the samsaric thinking. Of course, it won't go on too long. She'll realize and she'll stop and she'll make amends and pull herself out of it. But that can happen over and over again. How many times? Well, seven is a magic number. It means quite a few, but not a huge number. The next stage of enlightenment, the second stage of enlightenment, is the once returner. And the interesting thing about the once returner, it doesn't mean that you can stumble into samsara one more time by accident. The stream enter can stumble in without intending to multiple times. The once returner, that the once returner returns is totally on purpose. The once returner says, I'm going into samsara for the sole purpose of identifying every last vestige of craving in my mind and uprooting it. So the once the, the once return of the once returner is a deliberate return to samsara in order to confront craving and to overcome it. And what do you mean return? Like how do they how do they return? Well, it's an inner process. What it means is that allow the craving or a person becomes a once returner when they have the, it's a new awakening experience. And the insight and the realization that characterizes that awakening experience is the realization that I cannot rest so long as I am still beset by craving. Because they've had this experience that's intensifying more and more often as a stream enterer of realizing that. <coughs> My mind is going through one state, another state, another state, another state. And every now and then my mind is in this perfect state. But the rest of the time, it's really, not only is it not perfect, it just seems more and more rotten. And the difference between that perfect state that I sometimes experience and all these other states that I experience in between is they're all tainted by craving. And so this builds up into them, to a crescendo. And it comes this, like a bolt of lightning, this... You know, it's like, I am not going to rest. There is nothing else I can do that is more important than eliminating craving from my mind stream. And this is not the reincarnation mind stream. But I'm going to eliminate craving from my mind stream. So they go after craving. They want, the, you know, they're not trying to avoid it. They're going after it. They're returning to samsara specifically to confront craving. Now, the thing that happens... The characteristic of a, a once returner is that craving has become very weak. So they're in no danger. They can afford to put themselves in the way of craving. Because when they put themselves in the way of it and when it arises, they can deal with it. They're not in any danger of being overwhelmed by it. And so that is the once return of the once returner. When the once returner has finally uprooted every vestige of craving, to do with the desire realm, to do with the world, then they have no need to return to samsara again. And so, you know, they become the non-returner. They do not return to samsara because they have 
actually samsara doesn't exist for them anymore. They couldn't return to samsara if they wanted. <laughs> Can you give an example of how they put themselves in the way of craving? Go to a bar. What's that? Go to a bar. <laughs> I mean, well, uh, that in, terms of, uh, in terms of what an individual might do physically and materially in the world, that can vary a lot. Sure, yeah. But essentially what it means is that they're, they are open to and on the lookout for craving. And they will put themselves in any mental situation that is likely to bring craving to the surface. Practice tantra. What? Practice tantra. Uh, well, actually, now that is an interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that just brings up, because I mean, maybe this is just obvious, but I just haven't come here for a long time, but craving, is that just I mean, when I think of craving, I mean, the craving, the word in English sort of infers, like, Food or sex, more like, I think. But is there a different connotation in Sanskrit? It means absolutely Just any worldly any compulsion desire. towards having something through desire or avoiding or destroying something through aversion. So, so it's much much broader. Pleasure? But but food and sex, and they're food and sex are really good examples of it, right? They they're really good examples of it. Okay. Now, I. Uh, a once returner, it doesn't mean a once returner is going to spend all of his time in brothels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So and and as, as a matter of fact, that, that would probably be totally in, ineffective. But what it means is that a once returner is going to be very aware of sexual desire arising in any of the situations in which it arises. Okay. Right? It's, it's not... And... He's not going to be acting on it, or she's not going to be acting on it, because that's not the point. The point, the point is to have have it arise, oh, I see. so that it can be confronted and so that it can be released. Okay. And in general, you don't really need to seek it out. I mean, the opportunities in the world will find you, but. If you're living in a cave, you might have to seek it out in the sense that you have to go into the world. There, once at, to do the, to to achieve the work of a once returner, you really have to be in the world. You could possibly be in a monastic situation. You're still in the world, but you can't be in a cave. You've got to be out there in the world so that you have the opportunity to confront the craving. The Amish people is a good example of having less craving than... What's that? Amish people? Yeah. They are a good example, I guess, about cravings. They have much less cravings than we have. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know too much about the Amish, but there, there are there are many people, many, many different traditions and belief systems that do try to confront craving in different ways. And I wouldn't be surprised if they on the shark. They try to live very simply, which means avoiding the temptation of uh, a lot of sources of craving. But anyway, do you, do you see what I mean? I mean, look, yeah, you, I yeah, you don't have to go looking for it, but at the same time, you can't cloister yourself in such a way that, it, that, you're, that you're isolated from it. Right. There's, there's okay. the triggers for it. <coughs> The guy that goes off to a mountaintop when he's 19 and doesn't come down to his 50, I don't see how he's going to come down as anything other than a stream entry. We showed a movie about this. They did. <laughs> we did. We did. Yeah. Which one? Sasang Sara. Sasang Sara. Yes? I have two questions, and you may not be able to get to both of them. But one is, uh, how can your community, your Sangha, support you, I mean you, you, Chuladasa, in getting to that final stage? Is there anything we can do, is there anything we can do to support you, to help you? Oh, the, the best thing that you can do to help me is to, is to work on, work on yourself and work on spreading this dharma to as many other people as you can. That's the best thing that you can do for me. Um, 
my personal spiritual path is at a, is, is, is at a place where the more what I want to do is, is, is spread the teaching and anything you do to help me spread the teaching, which means learning it yourself and practicing it yourself and also transmitting it to other people. That's how you can help me more than anything else. And as a suggestion, this place needs volunteers like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, yeah. yeah. So, so take this to heart. Learn it. Study it. And there are all kinds of practical ways that you can help me disseminate this teaching. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to get it all out, and I'm getting it all out in these recordings. But uh, there's thousands of recordings now that are, are on the internet. But there's so many of them, it's impossible to find anything in them. And then again with a recording, not everybody has the time to listen to these things. So people who could transcribe this, and even better than that, people who could take the transcriptions of these teachings and put them in the form of books and pamphlets, or teach them themselves, or make uh, PowerPoint presentations that other people could use. There's all these practical things that you could do to help me, and I would just love to have you do that help. You know, what I put out there, those recordings that I put out, and there's another source too. There's the Jhana Insight Discussion Group. And for years I wrote all kinds of stuff there, and it's all there archived. And it's just waiting for somebody to take it. That doesn't even need to be transcribed. It needs to be organized and cataloged, which Blake's already done to a certain degree, started on. But, gee, I, I put all this stuff out there, just please, Take it and do something with it. Spread it. It's yours. Hmm. It's yours. You can put it in your garage and forget about it. I hope you won't. I'd much rather you take it and put it to work. But that's what it's there for. And that would make me really happy if you do that. I didn't know, studying Buddhism, I didn't know how to inform other people. But my sister, when she has a problem, she calls me up and says, what would the Buddha do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. yeah. So it's like do. my giving, being able to give her an answer, and whether she needs it or not, that's her, her prerogative, but it's the teaching. It's, it's and that's, teaching that's the other thing teaching. about this teaching. Offer it freely, but don't push. Yeah. yeah. Don't push at all. It's just, um, it's I, I also um, would... I think it would be lovely for us to have a, a work party, um, a fun party um, at Coach's Stronghold sometime in May um, before fire season. And, you know, just bring your eggs and, <laughs> and, you know, I, I, that's kind of percolating. So, you know, watch for that because that, we'd like that to be fun, but we'd also like the fire to be a bit more. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I think it's time to call this to a close. So just the final answer to Tessa's question, to help me attain my complete and final awakening, become awakened. That's the best thing you can do. Thank you.